Okay, we, we can start now. Uh, can you close the door, please? So, so uh, His Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for us to share uh, such a moment with you, especially for listening to a lecture or a presentation dealing with, the his uh, uh, with Cairo history and architecture and organized in cooperation with the uh, Linz Institute and Hungarian uh, Cultural Center Cairo in presence of his uh, uh, Excellency, so uh, Andras Kovacs, the ambassador of uh, uh, Hungary and uh, of the Cultural, uh, Cultural Councilor and Director of Linz Institute, Mr. Mr. Attila Svetek, and of the, the Cultural Attaché of the Embassy, uh, Anna Maria Shedro. So uh, I give the mic uh, for a moment to my colleague from the Cultural Councilor. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Attila Svetek Palla. I am the Cultural Councillor of the Hungarian Embassy. And first of all, I would like to warmly welcome everybody here. And I would like to say a special thank you to uh, Abbe Suash, the director of the French Institute for Oriental Archaeology, to host this event and uh, to organize uh, in cooperation with us uh, tonight this lecture. I also would like to say a big thank you to Dr. Ormos, Dr. Ishvan Ormos, uh, who accepted our invitation and who is with us today and who will make a um, very interesting presentation about his uh, newly published book, The Cairo in Chicago. Uh, I will give... Uh, yes. thank, you. Uh, th thank you very much. And tonight, as we said, uh, so uh, we welcome Professor Do uh, Dr. Uh, Ormos who, as you know, uh, has been teaching Arabic um, uh, for a very long time at Bud Budapest University. Professor Ormos is well known for, for his works. Uh, his work in particular for the book that he published in uh, 2009 uh, on Max uh, Herz, the Hungarian chief architect of the Comité de Conservation des Monuments Arabes, and first uh, director of what was become the Museum of Islamic Art. Everyone knows here the importance of this uh, outstanding work of research. And I think um, if it's not already the case, uh, know the importance of his new book, which has been published in a few months ago uh, by IFAO, and which is uh, entitled uh, Cairo in Chicago. So it's up to you, Professor. <clears throat> Thank you very much for, uh, for these kind words. And uh, it's a great uh, honor uh, for me to be able to, uh, to give a lecture here uh, tonight. And uh, of course, I could uh, elaborate on, on thanks and, and uh, gratitude. But uh, first of all, I would uh, like uh, to say a word of thanks to the uh, to the IFAO for uh, having published two wonder, really wonderful books on on Max Hertz now and um, and hey, many people sorry <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm in uh, I'm grateful to a great number of people, but I would like to single out one person at IFAO uh, who I first met as far as I can remember uh, 70, uh, 27 years ago, and it is Madame Nagla Hamdi, uh, who has been my editor for all these years and who has helped me uh, 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 really uh, uh, very much. And uh, without her constant help, and uh, I would not have been able to, uh, to uh, produce these books in the shape in which they uh, appeared at last. And, uh, and her, if I may say, friendship is also a, a great honor to me. Now, um, after all these uh, introductory words, which I do not want to uh, to uh, enter upon again. I would like to uh, talk about this uh, new book uh, of mine, 
and uh, uh, can we just please get to the no it's okay this is better oh yes that's it <clears throat> Uh, world's fairs became a characteristic feature of modern capitalism based on emerging globalization. The first World's Fair was held in London in 1851. Their aim was manifold. The organizers wanted to assemble and demonstrate in one great show the latest achievements in crafts, industry, agriculture, and commerce all over the world in order to enable a large number of visitors to get acquainted with the most advanced products and methods. Soon other fields of human activities were added, such as art, science, humanities, and even religion. After the addition of so many new fields, it was claimed that World's Fairs represented a comprehensive overview uh, or snapshot of human civilization at a given time. Entertainment played an important role at World's Fairs. In Chicago, it was relegated to a special area, the so-called Midway Pleasance. Here you can, uh, you can see a bird's eye view of the World's Fair. Uh, on Lake Michigan, you can see the so-called white city, the central part, so to say the serious part of the exhibition. And uh, to the left, you can see with the Ferris wheel, the giant wheel in the middle, and also the minaret of Cairo Street, the so-called Midway Pleasance. It was called Midway because it was located between two parks. And uh, Pleasance is an area where uh, one can have pleasant impressions. At the same time, the pronunciation of this word was not so easy. So most people, it, it is of French origin and nobody was sure how to pronounce it exactly. And so people mainly uh, refer to, uh, to this uh, strip of land as Midway. So it was relegated to a special area, the Midway Pleasance, so as not to interfere with the dignified uh, aura of the central section. The most popular feature was Cairo Street, which had first been installed at the World's Exhibition of 1889 in Paris as La Rue du Caire. It combined two widely popular uh, constituents features of the day, stage set architecture, or with the French word coulisse architecture and people's shows. Stage set architecture was familiar to the general public from theaters. In our case, it meant that replicas of city districts or characteristic buildings were constructed with ephemeral building materials, such as wood and brick for a limited period of time. They were not exact replicas of a city or of one of its districts, but ensembles destined to conjure up the atmosphere of a given city. These ensembles always served entertainment in one way or another, and the building erected in this way never fulfilled the original function of the building in question. For instance, in Cairo Street, the replica of Gamal Adin Dahabi's mansion was not a mansion because nobody lived in it. It was a museum. It was a museum. Nor was the Vikala in Cairo Street a Vikala, providing traveling wholesale merchants with accommodation. It housed a number of shops instead. These buildings wanted to entertain and edify. Many such ensembles were built at the time 
Old Edinburgh in 1886 at Edinburgh, La Rue du Caire, Paris, 1889, Venice in Vienna, Vienna, 1895, or Constantinople in Budapest, Budapest, 1896. In order to make the atmosphere of the ensemble as authentic as possible, Cairo Street in Chicago was populated with 170 per 75 persons, men, women, and children, transported from Cairo directly to Chicago. Further, a number of various animals, seven camels, 20 donkeys, monkeys, and snakes. There were also snake charmers there. The people went after their every, everyday businesses as usual, creating in visitors the impression that they are indeed walking in one of the main streets of medieval Cairo. This aspect connected it to another popular feature of the day, the people's shows. <clears throat> people's shows became very popular in the second half of the 19th century within the context of the great interest in distant lands, the culture of the other. This meant that members of various population groups were displayed mainly in zoos, where visitors could observe them going about their everyday businesses. It was thought that acquaintance with distant populations and their customs served to edify the mind and re refine the feelings gaining a better, uh, refine the feelings, gaining a better understanding of the other helped to define one's own place in society and the universe. There existed also a desire to escape to distant lands from the harsh realities of everyday life. The World's Columbian Exposition was organized to celebrate the 400th uh, anniversary of America's discovery by Christopher Columbus in 1492. That's why it's called Columbian Exposition. For problems of logistics, it was organized in 1893, a year later than originally envisaged. When preparations for the fair began, the President of the United States sent out invitations to all major countries all over the world. The Egyptian government received an invitation too and was eager to participate because from earlier occasions it was aware of the gains it would bring for the country in international prestige and reputation. For instance, Egypt's participation at the Exposition Universelle of 1867 at Paris, which Khedive Ismail also attended, was a great success. Egypt was in the focus of attention. However, in 1893, uh, uh, the Ministry of Finance in Egypt, which was controlled by the British occupying power, refused to provide the necessary funds. Therefore, there was no official Egyptian participation in Chicago. The fair consisted of two separate sections, an official section, this is the white city, which I have already shown to you, and an anthropological section, which also served as the entertainment section. This dual nature of the latter was the source of much ambiguity. The American exhibitions were housed in buildings erected in the Beaux-Arts style, based on French classicism and Renaissance architectures. Renaissance architecture. The buildings were painted white and were glowing in the sunshine, hence the name White City. This style conjuring up classical antiquity was a tremendous success with the public. And it was exactly in the context of this tradition that America wanted to present itself to the world as the realization of classical tradition, the fulfillment of the history of mankind. 
From another point of view, it must be pointed out that both in architecture and in other areas, World's Fairs made considerable contribution to progress and development. There was harsh competition among organizers of World's Fairs. Every fair wanted to surpass all earlier fairs, especially the previous one, in every respect and by all means. Such a case was the, was the invention of the Ferris wheel at Chicago, destined to surpass the Eiffel Tower of the 1889 Paris Fair. Well, this is the Ferris wheel or giant wheel. Uh, actually, Chicago wanted to surpass Paris by all means, and they were desperately looking for something very uh, very exceptional uh, that would surpass the Eiffel Tower, which was of course not that uh, easy. And the weirdest projects were considered. And uh, in the end, George Ferris, an American engineer, uh, appeared with the plan of the Ferris wheel, which was named after him. And at first, uh, many people objected to it because everybody was, or many people were convinced that it was unfeasible, it would collapse. But in the end, uh, he was allowed to go, uh, go ahead and it worked and it became a great sensation because it was of course an uh, exceptional feat of engineering, just like the, uh, the Eiffel Tower. But in addition, it was moving and it was much more and the Eiffel Tower did not move. So everybody felt it was something superior <laughs> the, to the Eiffel Tower. And it was, of course, a great, big success. And uh, people had the beautiful vistas from above. And here we have uh, some more photos of the giant wheel. The giant wheel, as we shall see, was located just next to Cairo Street. And here you can see the the ancient Egyptian temple from Luxor uh, with the inscriptions. The use of cheap ephemeral materials such as wooden brick and the great pressure and harsh competition together greatly facilitated daring experiments and taking risks in architecture, uh, in, in architecture at World's Fairs. A project called Cairo Street under the name La Rue du Caire was first staged at the Exposition Universelle of 1889 at Paris. It was a great success, therefore Chicago had to have it too. Cairo Street in Chicago was a private profit-oriented undertaking. Its manager was George Pangalo, whom you can see here, a Levantine figure of Greek, Italian, and British descent, born in Smyrna in the Ottoman Empire and working as a bank manager in Cairo at the time. Pangalo obtained the cooperation of Max Hertz to, pre to prepare the designs of the buildings. Actually, this is uh, uh, Max Hertz at the time of the Chicago Fair. This is the, the first uh, photo of Hertz we have at all. And uh, I'm greatly indebted to Al Al Habashi, to my great old friend who first showed me this uh, photo, uh, which he obtained somewhere in the United States later on. After I knew of its existence, I found its origin too. It is a Smithso in the Smithsonian Institution. And so uh, I could get a copy of it, but I owe its, uh, the acquaintance with this picture to Alal Habashi, who also, I, I imagine you also had a, uh, a reproduction of it. And I've fought, made a photo of that re reproduction. This is Hertz in 19, uh, 1913, after being promoted uh, to the 
uh, rank of Mir Miran, which <clears throat> involve the using the title Pasha II. Pangalo regarded Hertz's expert knowledge, <clears throat> as well as his standing with the Egyptian government as indispensable for his project. As an employee of the Waqf ministry, Hertz was in charge of Arab Islamic monuments in Cairo. At the same time, he was regarded as the best expert on Arab Islamic architecture, especially uh, in Cairo at the time. Soon after Hertz uh, uh, had joined the enterprise, he set up an office to prepare the plans for Cairo Street. He requested the studio of the architects Fellner and Helmer in Vienna to dispatch an architect from their staff to Cairo to work full time on the plans. They sent Ed Eduard Matasek uh, uh, to Cairo. This famous studio of Fellner and Helmer was specializing in the erection of theaters, another link to stage set or coulisse architecture. And Cinderella, now I would like, uh, <clears throat> just a moment. Now I would like to uh, show you a video uh, which was prepared uh, by, uh, by the, uh, stop, wait a minute. Uh, it, it was prepared by the urban simulation team of the University of California, Los Angeles. I found it on the internet. Uh, it is very instructive uh, in so far as uh, it shows what it must have looked like uh, walking along the street when it was empty. Uh, and of course, it gives you a very good idea about the street. And uh, you, you can just have an overall idea before we delve into details. There is no text to it. This is from the entrance. It is a walk from the entrance to the, to the exit, one of the two exits. There was a cafe right on the uh, right hand side. Some people wrote that uh, sitting in this cafe and watching the uh, the noisy and colorful life in Cairo Street is the most beautiful and most engaging sight one can have in the whole world. To the left, uh, you can see the mosque with the Sabil Kutab, and to the right, it is not so clear, is Gamal al-Din al-Zahabi's uh, mansion. In the back, in the in the background, you can see the theater where belly dance was performed. This is Gamal al-Din al-Zahabi's mansion. Actually, it bore little resemblance to Gamal al-Din al-Zahabi's uh, house or mansion, uh, but uh, it was named after it, and in certain details, uh, it resembled in it. it. It resembled it. There were fifty-seven shops in Cairo Street selling Egyptian products. Here you can see to the left. Uh, Abdurrahman Katkuda's uh, uh, Sabil Kutab in Sukar Nakhalsin, and to the right uh, from it is the dancing theater. 
And here is Lekeg Young's uh, Photoshop. He's a famous Armenian photographer who was also active in Cairo very much. He was also in Chicago and he made many photos in Chicago, which are sold as authentic uh, photos made in Cairo after the fair. Just the other day, I saw a book published by, the, uh, by AUC on Egyptian uh, photography, Marie Gulia or something. And there is a photo from Chicago too, with a caption that it is an authentic photo from Cairo. This is the Vicala to the left with the, uh, with the door, which you can see at EUC. It was first uh, pro uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, produced here in Chicago. And now you can see the Temple of Luxor. It was actually not part of Cairo Street, strictly speaking. It was originally an independent uh, enterprise but uh, they agreed with the manager of Cairo Street and uh, they also um, I mean, uh, joined the, the, uh, the compound. Actually, and there are two obelisks too. Actually, the Temple of Luxor was also very interesting, but uh, people were much more interested in the camels and in Cairo Street than in the Temple of Luxor. So uh, there was uh, considerable less attendance at the temple. And of course, all these things are described in details in my book. So if anybody's interested in the details there, you can find it. Well, and there's the exit. Can you, thank you. So it was a product of the urban simulation team of uh, the University of California, Los Angeles. Actually, the, the web address is, uh, can be found in my book too, on page 100 in the footnote, but uh, the, the web address is not valid anymore. I just uh, tried it out uh, uh, some time, uh, one or two weeks ago, and it doesn't work, but uh, it helps to find the website. And there, we, if you are uh, persistent, if you persist, uh, you can uh, trace this uh, this uh, this uh, virtual tour of Cairo Street. So it is there. Simply the address has changed. In the center of the street to the replica of Abdurrahman Kadhuda's Sabil Kutab, which you can see here in the middle, one of the landmarks of the old city. The beautiful mosque, the beautiful mosque uh, was a copy of Kaid Bai's funerary madrasa in the Northern Cemetery, except for the minaret, which was a replica of the minaret of Abu Bakr ibn Muzhir. Actually, this is a drawing uh, and uh, by a not very gifted art, uh, artist, uh, but still, it is very useful because it uh, gives an impression what, uh, what uh, Vista people uh, can have had at uh, Cairo Street because no, no, uh, no uh, photo camera, no lens was able to capture the minaret and everything else at the time. So there are no photos. We have photos uh, only of the details. This is a photo of Cairo Street uh, from the Ferris wheel, 
from a carriage of the Ferris wheel. And there you can see the minaret, uh, the mosque uh, and the minaret. And also what is very interesting, the lantern uh, of the mosque, this uh, square and round uh, uh, structure, which is a very interesting thing. I'm writing a lot about it uh, because uh, Hertz in the, uh, uh, designing uh, the Cairo Street also made experiments and um, he tried out ideas. He, he later on abandoned or, or kept. And uh, this uh, lantern is very interesting in this respect. The buildings in Cairo Street also, well, this is the minaret. Another view of the, of, of the mosque. There you can see the crowd waiting for entering the uh, belly dancing. This is uh, Gamal al-Din Zahabi's uh, house. This, uh, this, uh, ho this horseshoe arch, or this, it looks like slightly uh, Western African, but, uh, but um, from the Maghreb, it is slightly out of place here. This is <clears throat> the only picture we have of the interior of the Durka. Here on the right hand side, you can see the the Wikala uh, with this entrance door, which uh, Hertz later on also applied in the Janatris Villa. <clears throat> it is uh, from, uh, from, an, from a dubious uh, building which still exists in Darb al Abdana uh, in the vicinity of Sultan Hassan. <clears throat> of course, as I have mentioned, this Vikala was not a Vikala, uh, but, it was, uh, but it was a collection of shops where people could buy Egyptian products. It is the Vikala's interior. In order to secure an authentic appearance for the buildings in Cairo Street, Pangalo was keen on obtaining the greatest possible number of mashrabiyas. They were conspicuous, characteristic, and very picturesque elements of uh, traditional architecture, which used to dominate the general aspect of streets in Cairo. However, beginning with the rule of Muhammad Ali in the first half of the 19th century, uh, they began to disappear, partly because glass windows became more and more fashionable, and partly because their use was prohibited by law on the ground that being made of wood and projecting over the streets, they were apt to catch fire and conduct it in no time to neighboring houses in the densely built native quarters. It is also claimed that uh, uh, Muhammad Ali forbade the use of mashrabiyas because he needed all available wood for his fleet and wood is scarce in Egypt. Here you can see the mashrabiyas. They were all original mashrabiyas uh, hailing from Cairo. Well, <clears throat> we have already seen the external uh, <clears throat> site of the, of the theater uh, where belly dance was performed. This is the only photograph uh, produced by Le Caguian. Uh, which, uh, which exists of the interior, but it is a staged or set photograph in the windows, uh, in the mirrors, you can see that the seats are empty. The belly dancers uh, caused incredible excitement and Belly dance was, according to all contemporary accounts, the greatest sensation of the fair. 
This type of dance was known to some travelers in Egypt and readers of travel accounts may have heard of it without knowing exactly what it was. However, uh, it was totally unknown to the general public in America. What people saw in this theater was not in line with contemporary morals and with what they had been accustomed to. On the other hand, the show cannot have been as immoral as is often suggested and even by the standards of the time because there was no official intervention and it was never prohibited. Of course, every now and then articles in newspapers uh, 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 appeared that uh, in no time these, uh, this show will be closed down because it is so immoral, but uh, at least uh, a number of times we know that these, um, uh, these articles were sponsored by the manager so as to enhance uh, <laughs> uh, the number of visitors, and it always worked. And it was not the invention of Cairo Street, it was quite common in America that uh, whenever a show, uh, the number of visitors diminished, then, uh, then uh, they arranged that some of the dancers were arrested or something like that. And this publicity enhanced the number of visitors. Little is known about the history of the belly dance. The famous references to the voluptuous dancers of Gades or Cadiz in modern Spain, in Juvenal and Martial, first and second century AD, in whom many are inclined to see the first recorded performers of the ancient belly dance, attest no doubt to an ancient Mediterranean tradition of Phoenician Semitic ancestry, the ultimate origins of which are shrouded in the mystery of mankind's mythic prehistory. It is also known that there was a rich dance tradition in the Arab Islamic world in medieval times, especially in Abbasid Baghdad. Uh, modern belly dance is first recorded by Western travelers in the 18th and 19th centuries. It seems to have evolved from the dances of the Awalim and, Rawal and Rawazi. In its present form, it is the result of 20th century developments, partly due to Western influence. It was an intriguing question that we try to follow up. What was wrong with the belly dance at all? The problem was nudity and dance. What is wrong with them? What is wrong with nudity after all? We have been created naked, still we are expected to be ashamed of it. Why? This shame is not universal in the world. The ancient, Greeks were, the ancient Greeks were not ashamed of nudity, nor are a number of people all over the world. This is a complex and elusive question, and we have made efforts at elucidating it. Our readers will judge how far we have succeeded in this. A noisy and colorful wedding procession uh, moved along the street regularly and picturesque moolids, traditional celebrations, well, these are belly dancers, Egyptian belly dancers. They were all Egyptian, contrary to widespread rumors. We have their, the, the, the list of their names and where they were born, how old they are, and so on. This list comes from Ellis Island. Uh, the, uh, the whole troop uh, arrived in America uh, by ship, and all the names were carefully recorded, and they are accessible uh, nowadays. So there were, uh, there were uh, uh, wedding celebrations and picturesque moolids, traditional celebrations of prophet's birthday and of festivals of Muslim saints. Uh, judging from, a con from contemporary descriptions, it appears that the annual departure of the Mecca pilgrims caravan and its return were also regularly staged. This is the wedding procession. Uh, 
as far as the population is concerned, in addition to Kyrene Muslim and Christian Arabs, Jews, Armenians, Turks, and Afrangis, Europeans, there were also Sudanese warriors and Nubians whose awe-inspiring presence was greatly enhanced by the impact the Mahdi's war against Anglo-Egyptian government forces had made on contemporary American minds. Although the Mahdi was dead by the time of the Chicago Fair, his followers were still fighting and an end to the war was not in sight. This meant nothing less than that the foremost military power of the world, Britain, was unable to defeat an army made up of people who were supposed to be so primitive that they were not even capable of discovering what was good for themselves and therefore needed the helping hand of Westerners as the basic tenet of colonialism claimed. Apparently, the Mahdi's army was not so was helpless in many aspects. At the entrance to Cairo Street, there was also a replica of Pharaonic uh, Temple in Luxor, uh, about which I have already spoken. Here uh, you can see uh, snapshots made in Cairo Street, which show uh, what a crowd there was and, uh, and how busy it was. And of course, it was also something extremely uh, unusual to Americans that people could, uh, could uh, enjoy themselves. Uh, so hilariously, America was a sad, con sad country at the time. All sources agree uh, that Cairo Street was the most successful project on Midway Pleasance and of the fair as a whole, both as regards attendance figures as well as uh, concomitant material gains. The success of Cairo Street was such that a similar project was also realized at the Midwinter Fair of January 1894 in San Francisco, staged a few months after Chicago. Taking all relevant aspects into consideration, we can state that within the context of the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 at Chicago, Hertz Pasha's Cairo Street successfully contributed to disseminating knowledge about historical Cairo, one of the most beautiful and interesting cities in the history of mankind, and also offered the possibility to partake in her atmosphere for those who were unable to afford a trip to Egypt in an era when tourism was becoming more and more popular all over the world. The, this project is also a remarkable example of the interaction between East and West in the period of classical colonialism. I thank you for your attention. But uh, for, as a last uh, thing, I would like to, to, to show you one, one more thing. One more thing. As a conclusion, uh, this is the tomb of uh, Herz Pasha in Milan. Uh, when uh, and uh, when I was there for the first time in 1998 or 99, and a few years ago I was in Milan again, and I wanted to see the. Uh, tomb again, but uh, I could, it, it took a long time to find it, and I was quite astonished how, how come I don't, I can't find it, I, 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 uh, I, I know it quite well, and it is within a closed limited section of the cemetery, and in the end I found it, and this is what it is now, and of course uh, this plant has grown incredibly in the meantime, and I'm sure it is partly owing to IFAO's publication of these two books, and perhaps also my contribution to Hertz, that, uh, that, uh, house, that this plant uh, uh, grew up uh, out of his ashes so vividly in recent years. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor, for your presentation, very amazing presentation. And uh, I think uh, if you have some uh, comments or, or, or questions, Uh, thank you, Stefan, very much for uh, the presentation. Uh, brought back to me uh, years of research, but also uh, added a lot of uh, uh, really uh, weighted information and awaited information for the Cairo uh, street in uh, Chicago. Um, I have so many questions, of course, <laughs> uh, but I'm so interested to pinpoint some of the uh, uh, remarks I just wrote down. Maybe you, have, can, you can just fill up a bit the gaps you left us with. Uh, one of which would be, uh, yes, they took a uh, Pangalo, as you said, uh, took those authentic Mashabayas to, uh, to uh, Chicago. I'm not sure wh uh, whether they were documented before they were disassembled from uh, Cairo. Do you know how they were disassembled? Do you know they took artisans with them to Chicago to assemble them again? Uh, and uh, whether they were the lacuna, because they looked very neat in Chicago, uh, whether those, uh, uh, I'm sure there were any deterioration in the process that uh, the turning wood pr process had actually been introduced in Chicago uh, as such, if that is uh, the case. And, and one more question and uh, leave the ground. So you mentioned, I'm not sure if that's the case or not that I heard it right, that the Ministry of Finance uh, didn't want to sponsor that uh, exhibition. Exactly, and uh, uh, exactly. Uh, actually, uh, it was so that the government asked for support from the Ministry of Finance. And as in all ministries in Egypt at the time, the minister was always Egyptian and the vice minister, the deputy minister was a Brit British person who was actually in charge of things. And he and the government uh, uh, asked for a certain sum and, the minister, and this British gentleman was ready only to, uh, to, to, to uh, give uh, only, I don't know, a, a broken part of that sum, which the government thought was absolutely insufficient. And therefore the government desisted from the idea. And then appeared, uh, then came Pangalo, who was very, who was very uh, smart person. He had worked in a bank. And uh, first of all, he raised the, 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 the capital, the money for this, uh, for this, uh, uh, for this undertaking, for this pro project. And, uh, and there were several competitors in Chicago uh, for, uh, for the Cairo Street. And uh, he was awarded uh, the license uh, uh, because uh, because of the plans which Hertz had planned, uh, Hertz, Hertz had uh, uh, produced. In addition, uh, there was another thing uh, which uh, Pangalo very uh, very well did, namely <clears throat> in the United States at the time uh, it was not uh, allowed that architects uh, without license in the <clears throat> in the uh, in the state of Illinois would do anything as architects and pangalo on his one of his numerous uh, 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 one of his numerous uh, uh, trips to chicago he uh, he approached uh, cobb a famous architect at the time who was the uh, henry henry cobb henry e. i cobb and he was a well-known architect at the time in Chicago. And he was also a very close friend of, of Burnham, Daniel, David Burnham, the, the head of the whole thing. And he, he somehow reached that uh, uh, Cobb uh, realized that it was a good project. And from that point on, it was sure that uh, Pangalo would get it. And, uh, he will, and Cobb also became the representative of the project on the spot. 
I see it. So uh, did, did the Egyptian government at the end uh, recognize the, that the Cairo Strip? No, no. The no. Egyptian government was did not participate. So it wasn't it. an official uh, representation. No, it was a private enterprise. Okay. It uh, the Egyptian uh, government wanted to make it. Uh, we don't know what it would have looked like and how they would have done it. But since they did, were not given the, uh, the appropriate amount of money, then they simply stepped aside. And Actually, you... uh, Pangalo also visited uh, Khediva Taufik uh, to get his endorsement, his moral endorsement. And then when Taufik died, then he also visited Abbas Hilmi and uh, he also endorsed the project, but he, he, he was, uh, he had, uh, how to say, he had, uh, he was anxious uh, about what uh, would be the case with the mosque, what would happen inside the mosque, because in Paris he had bad experiences that it was, uh, I mean, the activities in the mosque were not appropriate in his opinion. But uh, Pangalo uh, assured him that, uh, in, uh, that the mosque will only serve religious, uh, religious aims and religious service. And of course, it was also part of the show that uh, Americans were uh, allowed to ascend the balcony inside the mosque and watch the prayer of the Muslims. And of course, it was, at the time, there were hardly any Muslims in America. And it was uh, really something extremely exotic to uh, see Muslims pray, pray. Any word on the artisans? On the artisans and... Uh... No, no. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I have no <clears throat> data on artisans. I have never seen any. What you are saying uh, makes me um, thinking about uh, the uh, memory of this event. Uh, can you add a few words about uh, the impact of uh, the event, the exhibit uh, in Egypt and uh, in the Arab world? Uh, actually, as far as I know, uh, in, in Egypt and in the Arab world, it, it is very little known uh, or was very little known, at least before I started writing articles on it. Um, uh, you know, when I arrived here in, in 97 and started working on, on, on Max Herzpasha, then I remember uh, uh, I used a very useful and, re and excellent MA thesis by Hind Nadim on the history of the AUC building. And, uh, and she came to the conclusion that it can only have been uh, Hertz who, uh, who, re who restructured the AUC building. And she also found that, uh, and it is written in her excellent P uh, uh, MA thesis at AUC, uh, prepared under George Scanlon, that, uh, uh, that uh, there seems to have been some previous connection between Hertz and Jana Kliss, who, who, who owned this villa before AUC, uh, and uh, that they may, might have done something at, at the fair in Chicago, and, but she knew nothing more than there seems to have been some, some fair of Chicago, but not more. So actually, you know, the trouble was that, uh, in my opinion, that uh, Chicago is very far from, from Egypt and so people could not, um, could not simply visit it. I wanted to include a chapter and in the, in the end I did uh, how Arabs saw Cairo Street in, Cairo, uh, in Chicago, but there is very little mat material on it. And originally in my manuscript, which I first submitted to uh, IFAO, I thought that um, just to replace uh, this lacuna, I made an extensive survey of uh, the view of Ar Arab visitors to, to Paris to the La Rue du Caire in 89, uh, because I thought uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, if they had gone to Chicago, they would have had the same opinion, because it was si uh, simply the same. But then, uh, I mean, my editors thought, uh, thought, uh, said that it should be, it is not Chicago, so it should be excluded from the manuscript. So I want to publish it as an independent article. 
and excuse me about uh, the about the, the impact of uh, of uh, of Cairo Street. So we have some uh, comments and uh, question uh, by uh, people who are attending online. Mm. And uh, if uh, thanks for uh, this presentation, I'd like to know why did you choose this title, Cairo in Chicago? Thank you for the presentation. I want to know how many ex uh, expositions that Cairo participated in at the turn of the 20th century, and uh, when uh, was the last one? And uh, finally, the information about the Islamic uh, element of Cairo Street is very valuable uh, here in the US. It's only the Pharaonic, pharaonic parts that are well known. Uh, actually, just to add one more uh, remark uh, to your question, uh, its impact uh, abroad. In Europe, I think there is little impact, but in the United States, there is very much impact uh, and uh, a considerable impact. And there is a, in the United States, everybody is convinced that striptease originated in Cairo Street. And, uh, and uh, the general idea is that there was a, the famous star of Cairo Street who was called Little Egypt, and she danced, uh, she first performed nude in the United States, but it is not true. In Chicago, there, in Cairo Street, there was no dancer known as Little Egypt. Uh, there is no trace of her. There is a whole, uh, a, an American lady made a research and she had found absolutely no uh, no, 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 no trace of Little Egypt in Cairo Street, and I had uh, gone through many uh, newspapers, in uh, American newspapers, and I had never seen an, 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 uh, uh, a reference to uh, Little Egypt in, in Chicago. There are later reports about her, but these are always later. And it can also be uh, shown that no, that in Cairo Street nobody uh, nobody uh, danced nude. So striptease was was a much later development uh, yes. in the United States. Yes, sure. Yes. Uh, another question in the room. Oh, uh, uh, just one more thing to add to you. Can you remember that uh, at one point we were sitting in your office, I can't remember where it was, and we were discussing this, uh, 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 this idea that how interesting it would be to make a study of Cairo Street in Chicago. And you, uh, and you said, yes, but how can it be done? And uh, so, so I, I, I think that's how the whole idea was born. It was uh, owing partly to you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I, I have another also question. If you have uh, encountered, if you have encountered the sketches on how to put together all of these architecture in a temporary way, no, so no, what, what no. are the what are the materials used? Did, did they use stones, uh, for example? No, uh, no, no. Uh, they they all they used wood and uh, they used uh, bricks. And uh, they were ephemeral mat materials because they were only to last uh, uh, half a year, six months, or even less. And, uh, and uh, the, a lot of wood was used and paper, papier mache and, and such things. And I, I do not have uh, uh, designs or nothing, nothing survives. I only had found in Chicago a ground plan of, uh, of Chicago, of uh, Cairo Street, which is kept in the, in, the, in the Art Institute in Chicago. And you can find a reproduction of it in the book in a special bag at the end of the book. Okay, a last question uh, online. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. I was curious if you could elaborate more on the people shows mentioned in the beginning. Uh, how come on the on the one hand visitors can see dancing belly dancers, praying Muslims, and on the other hand see people from the same country, in people shows? You can read. You can read the oh. question. Well, 
the first, thank you for the question. The first question is about people's shows. I, I, I could elaborate on people's shows, but I don't want to because it would take another one or two hours. But uh, there is a... a, a, there is a well, uh, what I've seen, uh, well, it was invented by a German gentleman, Karl Hagenbeck, uh, around 1874, that uh, he imported uh, laps from Finland, and uh, he took them around Europe, and, uh, and, they, and uh, they appeared everywhere, and, uh, and they were very popular, and people were very in, in, much interested in, in, in seeing them. Then very often they would be shown in, 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 in zoos, which today is uh, totally forgotten, uh, and uh, people just would watch them. Uh, but there is a very li rich literature on it. But uh, they, after a while, they, uh, uh, these were very, uh, very popular, but after a while uh, they disappeared. But a colleague of mine told me that even in the 1950s, he saw in Germany, in, a, in Hanover, in the zoo, uh, uh, people show. And, uh, and so it is not so absolutely uh, 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 abstruse idea, uh, but there is a very uh, rich literature and you can also, uh, also uh, uh, read in my book a brief uh, uh, summary of these uh, things with uh, references. How come on the, hand, one hand, on the one hand visitors can see dancing belly dancers praying Muslims and on the other hand see people from the same country? in people's shows. Well, uh, I can, can't see the, the problem. If you come to Cairo, here you can see belly dancers, praying Muslims, and also people uh, walking around the streets. <laughs> so it is, it is nothing special. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stéphane. So, uh, so merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour, pour uh, avoir participé. Thank you uh, very much for coming. For, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and nothing, and thank you, bye-bye. Thank you very much.